So next up, we, uh, we're going to hear from Kevin Parkin. He is the uh, systems director for Breakthrough Starshot. He's the one that makes us all talk to each other and uh, you know, behave. And uh, he's also the founder of uh, Parkin Research and has done a bunch of really cool work in uh, pioneering uh, microwave thermal rockets. So it's... Thank you, Zach. Right. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about beamed energy propulsion as well. Um, Let's see, I have many buttons to choose from. Let's try this one. Oh yes, okay. So I'm gonna talk about progress in beamed energy propulsion. Um, and it's a subject that's close to my heart. I've been working in it since 2002. Um, beamed energy propulsion doesn't just apply to microwave and laser-driven sails and breakthrough starshot. Beamed energy propulsion applies to other types of space propulsion. Uh, in particular, Earth-to-orbit -or propulsion can benefit uh, from the cost savings you get by transporting energy through a beam instead of transporting energy by hauling liquid propellants or other types of propellants around. Um, in space propulsion, uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, moving space debris around and spacecraft around uh, using energy from beams. And then I'm going to touch on some of the progress that has been made uh, in interstellar propulsion with breakthrough Starshot. Um, so beginning with Earth to orbit propulsion, um, in propulsion, there are two big figures of merit for any engine. Uh, one of them is the thrust to weight ratio, uh, and the other one is the specific impulse, uh, which is, is the thrust per unit mass flow rate for any engine. So it's related to the energy density of the fuel that you're using. Uh, and you can plot all of the engines uh, on, on these axes. And so this is a plot of both rocket engines uh, and aircraft engines. And if you look uh, towards the upper left-hand side, uh, this area is the chemical rocket engines. And down toward the bottom, uh, you see the early RD engines. Uh, they sucked. I mean, relatively, they sucked. Uh, low thrust to weight ratio, uh, you know, less than one, you don't even get off the ground. Uh, and low specific impulse as well. So they did not sip fuel, they gulped fuel. Um, but then if you look off to, uh, let's try this. No laser, all right. Well, if you look off to the right-hand side, uh, you see a, a line of dots uh, where they reach a kind of limit in specific impulse. Those are the hydrogen-oxygen engines. Uh, and they're limited by the energy density uh, of that chemical reaction, 16 megajoules a kilogram. Um, to make a rocket that has a high payload fraction, you want both high specific impulse and high thrust to weight ratio, and there's a trade-off that goes in there. So the newer engines, like the Merlin engine uh, on the SpaceX rockets, have lower specific impulse, but higher thrust to weight ratio. Um, you can bypass the energy density limit of chemical reactions by going to uh, nuclear thermal rockets. So you're, you've got nuclear energy instead of chemical energy. Um, I think Timberwind was one of yours, Pete, wasn't it? Timberwind was a nuclear thermal rocket uh, hydrogen propellant. Ah, oh, well, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> so moving swiftly onwards. Uh, <laughs> uh, these are the aircraft engines, uh, high specific impulse. Uh, you've got propellers down at the bottom right. Just going from that uh, to the higher thrust to weight ratio of jets was a huge breakthrough. It transformed air travel. Um, and this is what we believe that beamed energy is going to be able to do for rockets. Uh, it gets you, for any given propellant, it, it gets you a higher energy density in the propellant because you're not limited by the energy of chemical bonds. So you get a higher thrust to weight ratio and a higher specific impulse. And you can, you can choose uh, how much you have of each of those by choosing uh, your propellant. Um, so that's what we're aiming for. And the combination of high thrust to weight ratio and a high specific impulse gets you a lot greater payload for your vehicle. And if you have more payload paying for the same amount of vehicle, then you have uh, uh, much better economics for your rockets. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, almost an aside here, I just wanted to lay out the uh, approaches to launching payloads into space with beamed energy. And you can categorize them by the type of energy source and whether it's pulsed and continuous wave. Uh, so the first ideas that were proposed uh, were laser uh, pulsed rockets back in the 1970s by Kantrowitz and uh, at roughly the same time, Minovich. Um, and the, the name of this, uh, the one that's shown in the bottom right is the laser light craft uh, of Lake Mirabeau. Um, the one in the lower left 
was proposed next in 1992 uh, by the late Jordan Kerr, uh, my friendly rival. We decided we were friendly rivals um, because I proposed uh, the microwave thermal rocket in 2002. So we figured that we would disagree on many approaches and then sort of in the end converge on what was the optimum solution for a thermal launch to orbit. Uh, and then there's a pulsed version of the microwave rocket, uh, which is uh, being developed by the Kamurasaki Group at the University of Tokyo. Beamed energy propulsion is roughly where Goddard was in 1930 or so, uh, when you look at things. So it's very early days. There are not polished results. The altitude that you've got to with these things is only about 70 meters. Uh, the amount of money spent is comparable as well. Um, so this is very early days for beamed energy propulsion. So I just wanted to set expectations. <laughs> the way a thermal rocket works is that you take away the combustion chamber. Uh, you're not using chemical energy that's stored in the, in the bonds of the propellant. Instead, you're replacing the combustion um, chamber uh, with a heat exchanger. And that heat exchanger has to absorb energy from a beam uh, that is directed from the ground. Uh, so the heat exchanger gets hot as it absor absorbs the beam. And then through many small channels, uh, you have a propellant. And that propellant is heated as it goes through the channels. And that, that thermal energy, as it goes through the nozzle, is converted to kinetic energy. And that's what produces the thrust for a rocket engine. So the concept of how this would work uh, you have the Earth, you have a destination orbit that you want to get to, you have a beam director, uh, and the atmosphere imposes a limit on how low toward the horizon you can get the beam director. Uh, you uh, want to get a certain altitude in the sky where you can acquire the rocket with your beam director. So you acquire the rocket, the heat exchanger gets hot, uh, you, you reach about seven kilometers a second, and you reach the edge of your beam range uh, and you release your payload into its destination orbit. So the beam follows the, follows the heat exchanger, which faces it up through the ascent trajectory. Uh, then you have the option of reusing the rocket. Um, that's something you don't have to do. It, it can be very cheap without it. So um, one of the things that we've looked at over the years is which is the best propellant to use? This happened in chemical rockets. People explored all kinds of interesting propellants to use. My, I guess my favorite was the, the uh, hydrogen fluoride. Hydrogen and fluorine plus a bit of lithium uh, probably dissolved the launch pad. But um, uh, so I was interested uh, in a few different propellants. Originally, I thought hydrogen would be the best. It has the highest specific impulse. Um, and it gives you the highest payload fraction for the rocket. Um, also, water is of interest because it's everywhere and uh, known to be non-toxic. Um, but actually, methane comes out the best when you do the analysis, or at least from this model it did. Um, but I want to draw your attention to the top right-hand side, the cost reduction factor. So depending on how hot you can get that heat exchanger, um, you can get uh, a lot more payload for the same amount of dry mass that you have to create for the rocket. Um, by a factor of maybe 4 to 16, depending on how hot you can get the heat exchanger. So heat exchanger temperature is a key figure of merit. Um, that factor of maybe 4 to 16, uh, that factor is on the top line uh, of this chart here. So uh, you've got more payload paying for the same amount of rocket by a factor of 3 to 12. Also, these rockets are now single stage to orbit. So you don't have all of the complex, uh, complexities associated with having multiple stages. Um, and you only have one propellant, uh, which is not necessarily uh, going to burn if it's released in air. If you multiply these things together, depending on how you're feeling that day, you're saving a factor of six to a factor of maybe 100 in cost. And uh, the structure of your vehicle, instead of being mostly tank, is mostly payload. So. Um, there have been many models that showed these results in different ways over the years. Um, but one thing that hadn't been looked at until relatively recently was if you can do all of this, um, how cheap does the energy have to be? How cheap does the beam director have to be in order to make this economically a worthwhile thing to do? 
Um, one of the, the big inhibiting factors has been the cost of lasers and the cost of microwaves. Uh, cost of lasers is a big inhibiting factor for breakthrough Starshot. But these costs are coming down on both fronts. Uh, microwaves are already at a center watt. Um, you've, they found uh, a commercial application of microwaves in, in cooking. Everyone owns about a kilowatt of microwave generator, and that brings the price down to a center watt. Um, so anyway, this is an economic analysis. The first column is the, the baseline. That's what we have today. Uh, and if you're a pessimistic, uh, and you create a 200 kilowatt uh, beamed energy launch vehicle, not sorry, 200 kilowatts, 200 kilogram payload beamed energy vehicle, that actually only serves about 1% of the market by mass. Um, and you assume that you have uh, three megawatts per kilogram of payload, so uh, that ratio is kind of pessimistic as well. Um, and you assume these things going down the column, then it actually makes sense to do beamed energy at $1 per delivered watt. So this is the number of watts that are delivered to your payload. It's a figure of merit. Um, but as you grow the launch vehicle to larger and larger, uh, your price goes up. So you can actually make it work at $22 a watt if you think that you're going to have 100% of the market uh, and um, you're saving a very great deal of money. Um, the US government spends $170 million a week on launch, which most people don't know. Uh, you can save most of that if you bring the cost down by a factor of 10. So uh, probably around 2012, we were approached by DARPA, and they said, uh, we want you to build us a microwave launch vehicle. And they said, you know, for a few million dollars, can you build us one that goes to orbit? And I said, well, not for a few million, no. Um, but what we can do is demonstrate many of the key milestones associated with this, things that people doubt. Um, one of the main things that people doubted was the heat exchanger, that you could get it that hot, that it wouldn't shatter from thermal shock. Uh, so this is the result of one of our early tests. We built a lab and we attached it to uh, the beam line at the D3D fusion reactor, uh, the General Atomics Fusion Reactor in San Diego. And we, it's a megawatt beam, but we actually downrated it to 20 kilowatts. And we put a carbon layer on the inside of alumina tubes to show that you could absorb the beam, you could reach the temperatures, it didn't shatter. Um, because this was a DARPA program, they like things fast. Uh, so they wanted a rocket on their desk by Monday morning, pretty much. So we pivoted to the next stage of the program. Uh, the next stage of the program was to make a millimeter wave beam director and to integrate that heat exchanger with a rocket. Uh, so uh, just to show you the layout here, on the right-hand side, uh, you have a 100 kilowatt millimeter wave source. Um, the, the target is uh, on a launch rail. So that would be the rocket with the heat exchanger. Uh, so you have the microwaves uh, that hit, they, they go through a, a parabolic dish. They hit this turning flat, which has a, an actuator behind it, and uh, they're steered onto the rocket. There's also a tracking camera, which looks through the same turning flat uh, and keeps the rocket at the same place in the field of view. Um, that's how the beam director worked. Uh, and then we uh, integrated the heat exchanger into a rocket. Uh, this is a test flight. Now, let me be clear. This rocket would have gone up anyway, even if we hadn't even heated the heat exchanger. Um, but what we were able to do was heat the heat exchanger to glowing, let it go, and uh, the program ended at roughly the point where we were tuning uh, the, the control system to track the rocket. So we were able to get that heat exchanger very hot, uh, we had all kinds of issues that are the issues you find when you do something for the first time. Um, so we managed to, uh, this was a stretch goal anyway, nobody thought we would get this far. Um, but we did this, uh, and uh, you can do it. Um, but it needs, a, it needs work on coatings of the heat exchanger and all kinds of other factors. Uh, so this is uh, roughly the timeline of how it happened, the history. Um, I started work on this actually for my PhD thesis back in 2005. Um, and uh, our first test flight was 2014, so well, it's inside 10 years, that's pretty good. Uh, there is a laser version of this, which as I said was uh, proposed by Jordan Kerr. 
so instead of having a microwave beam director, you have a laser beam director. There's advantages to doing it this way, or there's advantage, advantages to doing it with microwaves. Uh, so Jordan and I collaborated on papers that looked at both ways of doing it. But this was Jordan's concept, uh, which is similar in many ways. Uh, but the really nice thing about this beam director is it's modular. You can start small, and then you can just add modules. Uh, so pulsed rockets. Um, we've talked about continuous wave, which goes hand in hand with a heat exchanger approach. Um, pulsed sources go hand in hand with pulse detonation engines. Uh, so it's different physics that you are powering with the sources. So on the left is the laser light craft of Lake Mirabeau, who I should say was the co-PI of that last program that I showed you. So Lake and I worked together on the microwave stuff as well. Uh, and on the right-hand side uh, is the microwave rocket of the Komurasaki group uh, in Japan. Um, so the way pulsed rockets work is they are fundamentally a pulse detonation engine cycle. You absorb beam energy, and there is a plasma that grows and as that plasma, uh, as the plasma density increases, that plasma starts to increasingly reflect the beam. So you, it can't be a steady state cycle, but it then explodes. It's a, a laser or a microwave supported detonation, uh, and uh, the, um, the propellant from that propels the rocket forward. And I'll show you a video of that in a minute. Um, but this is the engine cycle. Uh, you have a discharge that starts um, at the top of the rocket and works its way down, uh, and then you have uh, a lot of whatever the propellant is expelled from the end. Um, this is video of the microwave rocket operating in slow motion, uh, but that's how it works. And uh, this is the laser light craft. Uh, so this is the world record. Lake Mirabeau set the world record back in 2000. And the altitude record is 71 meters and still standing. I think you know, we can do a lot better than that now. Um, but this is his record flight. Really, the rate determining step for the development of these things is not the propulsion itself but it's been the availability of the beam directors, both on the laser and the microwave side. Um, so it's, it's really about the cost of making these beam directors and the cost of the sources involved. Um, since I'm running out of time, I'll um, skip the in-space. You can move debris around. Uh, you don't necessarily have to deorbit it. Um, you can use lasers, uh, instead of just ablating it, you can use lasers just to perturb the orbit if you have a very good knowledge of where things are. Uh, that's another application. You could do that now, except there's a big question about liability. If you move something in orbit, then it collides with, you own it. You know? uh, so then you own all of the collisions that it has there afterwards. Um, orbit transfer, you, uh, Leo to Geo and Geo to Geo is another application. Um, interstellar, uh, we have the laser sails. Um, so Jeff showed the video, or no, you showed the pictures of the microwave one. Uh, this is the laser version of that, or it would be had I not just pressed the clicker. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll never know, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, so breakthrough Starshot, um, the inputs. Um, so I just what I wanted to say about Starshot is that there is a system engineering process and there is a system model. And all of the time, uh, this system model is growing in... Um, uh, maturity and it is producing point designs. These change a lot, so we haven't we don't present them be because they change. You know, you put the numbers out there, they change again. But here's the kind of numbers involved: uh, for a 20% the speed of light point design with a one gram payload, uh, we're assuming all of these things on the left. We're assuming very cheap lasers. Um, you get uh, a capital expenditure of less than 10 billion dollars. Uh, most of that, under these assumptions, most of that money goes into energy storage, actually. But the key thing, or I, I didn't even press it that time, but uh, let's try it backwards. All right, the key thing here is the energy cost of each star shot is a thousand times less than the capital cost of the beam director. So once you've built one of these beam directors, you're going to send, you're going to send these probes everywhere you can get to with that beam director, and you're going to send them as often as you can, every few weeks, maybe. Um, the acceleration, as Jeff already said, 15,000 Gs when it starts the trajectory. Uh, by the end of the trajectory, 2,300 Gs. 
uh, mentioning trajectories, here's the trajectory that goes with that point design. Uh, you start off within about a minute of acceleration, uh, you pass the orbit of the moon, or you would do if you were headed in the plane of the solar system, you're actually 60 degrees down if you go to Alpha Centauri. Uh, cost, um, if you vary the uh, final speed, uh, you can actually get up past 90% the speed of light if you're willing to build a beam director the size of London. Um, and microwave sales I'm going to skip. So just to summarize, uh, these things all become possible as the dollars per delivered watt goes down. As a lower bound on the dollars per delivered watt, uh, you can use the source cost. So you can make arguments that some of these applications are already possible. So microwave beamed energy uh, launch is already possible. Lasers are very nearly, laser thermal launch is very nearly there. Uh, and there's uh, cost reductions that are needed for laser-driven sales, um, such as breakthrough Starship. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.